And I think it's a little scary too sometimes because like you look at us black men right here, sometimes we are the, the reason why some people keep their racist views. And we also have to be conscious of this with black people. And what I mean by that is they can look at Aaron and Michael and say, they made it, why can't you? And then they like, they pull themselves up by the bootstraps, but it's like not everyone has boots and is fighting the same, fighting the same fight. And then at the same time as a black man, I have to make sure that I'm humble too and not looking down at another black person saying, well, why didn't you make it? That's where I think you talked about like blessings. I got to realize that grace. Mm -hmm. Do I think I've made good choices? Definitely. But at the same time, I have to look at like, oh, I made a very stupid choice right there. But thank God for his grace. And I think just realizing that and identifying the problem and realizing that grace is why we are in the position that a lot of us are in yeah. and just having to humble and not think too highly of yourselves is very real and how we can start making even more change for sure. Hi, I'm Mike Westendorf. I'm the moderator for the Mile Markers Time of Grace videos that uh, we've been putting out here. And just want to thank you for joining in on the one that we've been talking about here, our most recent conversation on race and the challenges that we face in our country. Um, we're grateful for the comments that we've received, all coming through email and for social media, personal conversations that we've had on this very challenging topic. I want you to know that we see your concerns and uh, we will be having additional conversations that will address some of those uh, as we go on. We are seeing, we are hearing, we are listening. And right now what we're really trying to do as a strategy is to be able to take time to listen and to hear from people that we haven't maybe always heard from and to be able to really listen to some excellent Christian perspective uh, maybe that we haven't always heard before. But we do know and we realize that there are other things that are a part of this conversation and we'll be addressing those in future videos as well. So thank you for your, your comments. Thank you for your concern that Jesus Christ be lifted up in His, in his truth and purity, that the gospel be proclaimed. Uh, we're grateful that so many people are there. Continue to pray for us and pray with us and, uh, and continue to be a part of this journey. We look forward to it. See you. John 13:34. A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. In Romans 12, for by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. Just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ, we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. I'm Mike Westendorf, from the host of our Mile Markers uh, conversations that we have. So grateful to be able to talk to so many young adults through this and to have this panel together. This is part two of the conversation. Uh, yes, we didn't change our shirts because we just <laughs> knew that the video was long enough and we had to take a break. But this is part two of a conversation that we've been having. We're talking about race. We're talking about community. We're talking about white privilege. We're talking about the church. We're talking about Jesus. And um, so grateful to have these five people part of this. Brothers and sisters in Christ, um, but coming from very different spaces and perspectives and backgrounds. And so um, if you're just joining us, if you didn't see part one, we're just going to do a quick intro again. And, and uh, um, I'm, I'm tempted to say, let's start with the young ones first, you know, so that all the old people get to go last. <laughs> so Michael, why don't we start with you and, and then, yeah, introduce okay. yourself one more time. And um, I'm Michael again. Uh, I graduated from Pius. Uh, I work a lot. Uh, things I don't, things I do while not working is playing Fortnite, playing basketball, or going to sleep. Uh, my name is Janai. I am 22, recent college graduate, psychology degree uh, from Sheboygan, Wisconsin. 
I'm Sydney Giovinazzo, 26 years old. Uh, I've gotten the opportunity to work uh, at Kingdom Prep Lutheran High School for the past about five years, um, both as a teacher and now stepping into an internship role where we get to introduce our 60 juniors into what does it look like to have purpose in post-secondary life and what is God calling me into as far as my work goes. Uh, so stepping into that role next year. And you are working with primarily? Primarily African-American community, uh, young men only uh, in our school. So. <laughs> it's a blessing. C.L. Whiteside, 32, assistant principal at Wisconsin Lutheran High School, born and raised in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Aaron Robinson, uh, pastor at Fairview Lutheran Church, uh, born and raised in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and uh, excited to be here. I'm, I'm 46 years old. Yeah, <laughs> I'm 46 too. Uh, Mike Westendorf, uh, most of my life in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, uh, four years in the Twin Cities. So some of the things that are on the news, uh, I walked those streets for a little while. And, um, and so grateful to uh, have all of you guys here. When we uh, left off, uh, we were talking a little bit about the Eurocentric uh, picture of Christianity. Um, and uh, I said, I'd like to go and ex just just... I've never heard that before, and this is just a context thing for those of you who are like, well, you, you know, find out where we came from by watching the first part. But uh, just starting there, because I think it's actually a pretty good context just to have in the back of our minds as we talk about some of the things that are happening that we want to talk about in this segment. But that was new to me. Can you go a little bit further with that? See, I might start off. I thought it was you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it's just more so looking at history and painting a, a, a white Jesus, and a lot of times that might get pushed onto a, a, a black church, and just looking at history and where everything started from in the very beginning, just looking at was Jesus really white? No, he's probably some brown or olive skin type complexion. And, and I think when you're trying to do, when you're trying to love as Jesus loved, as you read earlier, um, but you don't acknowledge that there's a flaw in what you were putting forth, it, it looks deceptive. And, and then it makes those who aren't part of that Eurocentric view uh, feel like they don't fit in or belong. And it causes more separation in the church than, than we would want, than we know that God would want in the church. And um, it makes outreach really hard to do. Uh, and so, yeah, Jesus was Jewish from Israel. We should, we should present him as such. And then we should also treat each other as if we know he, could, he died for the world, not just for one group. And um, I think, I don't know if I said this in the last segment, I'll say it again. Uh, you should, we should never make the comment that thank God that he allowed slavery so that they could get the gospel to the black people. Um, God can get the gospel however he chooses, when he chooses, to whomever he chooses. So let's not um, put that, that narrative with slavery. Right. You know, well, it's a good thing because no, it's, it's, it was always bad. It, mm -hmm. But God works on all things for the good of those who love him. Right. But let's not make that a good thing because of that. Right. Mm -hmm. Amen. Um, we have been talking a little bit uh, uh, off camera about uh, community. And, and I had asked um, you know, before just what's a question that you guys would, would like to see covered. And, uh, Michael, I don't know if you want to <laughs> throw it out to you first, but... What, what was it that you had wanted to see us talk a, about? Because it kind of uh, got us into this, this conversation. Um, so, well, black people, uh, this goes back to Pastor uh, Robinson, what he said in part one, that black people haven't experienced what other black people have experienced. Yeah. Um, and that goes on to fear, which is a hard thing I struggle with because I'm so positive. <laughs> so, you know, when, when, I, when I see media and I see, you know, um, a white cop kneeling on a black person for nine minutes. I think, okay, why is he doing this? What, what, what did he do to, you know, to, to be on his neck that long, you know? And then that's where it goes into, you know, um, the black, the black uh, community and um, of that, that fear. And then that, you know, um, I'm such a positive person that I don't usually see racist or I haven't experienced racist yet. You know, I'm like the only black person that go to St. Paul's Mexico Church. Mm -hmm. And when I walk in, I don't, I don't, I, when they stare at me, I don't feel uncomfortable. I feel, you know, a change, you know, I'm a, I'm a black person going to an all white church. I see a change and a good positive attitude. You know, I'm here to learn about God. Mm -hmm. And you know, my girlfriend, she really gets mad at me because 
you know, if it's a 55 speed limit, I'm going 60. She's like, baby, you're black. You can't go over <laughs> this, the, you know, five miles per hour because you're black. You can get pulled over, you would die or get shot, you know. And she says, if I'm white, I can get away with that. But since you're black, you know, you can't do those things. You can't, you can't go five miles per hour just because you're black. And, you know, it's hard for me to see that because I don't usually live in fear, you know. If I see a white person doing it, you know, why can't I do it? And then she says, you're black, you know, this, this is a big issue. So, um, yeah. So if I can pee back. So that, that's a different conversation a little bit. And that's the, the younger generation's conversation. Growing up, I was always taught, I've got to do, twi work twice as hard to be considered half as good. So, so I didn't grow up with the, I can do what white people would do. I was told, you better not do what white people do because it'll be worse for you. And so, so at 46 compared to 20, our vantage point is even different about how we view what we should be able to do or what we want to do or, 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 or can do. And instead of my caution at 46, he, he's saying, I, I don't want to have caution. Right. I want to be able to, to go 65 and 55 like everybody else is doing. And I'm saying, I'm in, I'm in Milwaukee, I can do it 65. I go to Muskego, I'm doing 54 <laughs> just in case. Yeah. So, so there's a difference in age group generationally where even as two black men, we view our role and, and, and what, how our race affects what we do. You know? and, and that's one of the things with this struggle, um, the, the current climate that is somewhat frustrating from, from my vantage point because it sounds like when I hear protesters speak, especially the, the young ones, it seems like they don't want to acknowledge that for 60 years we've had positive growth. That it's better than it was when I was born. And there have been huge strides made. But when I hear them talking about it, I don't hear them saying anything that you would, you would think from the way it sounds, King was shot and then Floyd was shot, and then Floyd was killed, and nothing happened in between. And, and as, as a 46 year old who lived a whole life, navigating through this thing that was there called racism, it is offensive to me a little bit. We did have a struggle. We got through a struggle. That's why, that's why you can talk like you do because we went through a struggle. But, but, we, but I, that's the different conversation, sorry. No, that's <laughs> but but I, I definitely understand the difference because I have a 19 year old daughter who calls me on the carpet. She's like, but dad, you're like, and I'm like, that, that's how I learned to get through. There was a different way to, to maneuver that the younger generation says, no, nah, we're not maneuvering, we're going straight through this joker. This is not, and, and I, I have a hard time at 46 because I'm like, okay, that's not what I was taught, that's not how I was trained, and that's not how I got through to be where I'm at, but. I'm kind of curious, you're in the middle of, of those two. Yeah, I think you just have to be very conscious of history because if you don't acknowledge that and actually know the history, you can start to think nothing changed. And there definitely has been great change. Of course, we would like to see a lot more change, but there, there has been change. Yeah. And I think it's a little scary too sometimes because like you look at us black men right here, sometimes we are the, the reason why some people keep their racist views. And we also have to be conscious of this with black people. And what I mean by that is they can look at Aaron and Michael and say, they made it, why can't you? And then they like they pull themselves up by the bootstraps, but it's like not everyone has boots and is fighting the same fighting the same fight. And then at the same time as a black man, I have to make sure that I'm humble too and not looking down at another black person and saying, Well, why didn't you make it? That's where I think you talked about like blessings, I gotta realize that grace. Mm -hmm. Do I think I've made good choices? Definitely, but at the same time I have to look at like, oh, I made a very stupid choice right there, but thank God for his grace. I think just realizing that and identifying the problem and realizing that grace is why we are in the position that a lot of us are in yeah. and just having to humble and not think too highly of yourselves is very real and how we can start making even more change for sure. Yeah, that's awesome. Michael, as you hear older guys talk, you know, about it. Um, yeah, that kind of remind me of my parents. You know, I get that <laughs> phone call Come from on. my mom. You know, Michael, be safe out there. There's police out there. I'm like, mom, I'll be okay. I'm just going 70. They going 70. Why can't I go 70? So they kind of, you know, they, they remind me of my parents because my parents, you know, they call me every day just to make sure I'm safe just because, you know, most of the time I'm in Franklin, Muskego, New Berlin. 
I work in those areas. So they just, you know, they, they called me just to make sure I'm safe, but I feel like I am safe. I don't feel like, I, I don't fear, you know, myself, you know, getting arrested and getting shot. I don't fear that. I just feel, you know, uh, do the right thing. And that, that's just it. But yeah, I understand where they come from because my parents are about their age, so. <laughs> you know, it's funny, Mike. Parents so, not my age. <laughs> <laughs> so what's funny is, is early 2000s, like maybe 2005, a buddy of mine was getting married in, in uh, Dallas. So we're gonna drive from the Twin Cities to Dallas. I, told, I called my mom and I told her, and she gave me a list of counties not to stop in. <laughs> That's how serious it was for her. And I'm like, my, this is you know, the 2000s, we're good. You know, I, I was like you to her right. as you are to, to your parents. I'm like, she had a list of counties. She says, don't stop in these counties because she had memories of, of the racial divide in the South in, in her day. And I thought she was just being overly protective right, and overly right, cautious, right? right? But, but that's the difference in the struggle that we've gone through. It, it changes generationally. It, this isn't the same struggle that it was 30 years ago. You know, it's, it's, it's changed. It's gotten better, still more change to happen. And so those who are now trying to make that next change d- d- can't waste time, I, you know, no history, but they can't waste time applauding the past achievements and missed moments right now to achieve. And that's kind of where I think we, we need unity in, within the black community generationally, that we don't just uh, dismiss the young because they're, they're louder than we want to be and they don't dismiss the old because we're not moving as fast as they want us to. But that we say, this, that for all of us under this tent, you know, and, um, and yeah. yeah. Can I just take a second? I don't know if this is gonna be too much of a tangent, but just going back to something that you said I think is really important. You said that sometimes people look at you as the reason that, as a, as a reason, however you said it, to still, as white people, to still be racist. Because you said, well, you made it, why can't? I would just love to hear more on that. Because I think, like, if we're being honest yeah. with ourselves, sometimes that is very true, as like horrific as that sounds. So, first of all, everyone doesn't know me. They only can know snippets or what right. I allow them to know. So they might not know. Like, I had to talk to some of my guys about this before, too. Like, there was a privilege that I had, a two-parent household privilege. Right. I know I, I talked to him before about, like, you know, having the fact that our parents did have a little bit of money. So that was a privilege right. and a cushion that you talked about that we had. That sometimes white people say, well, he made it. Why can't you make it? And because the area I live in, for some people, white people will consider it a ghetto or the hood. But is it really? Right. So it's just one of those things where it's so many levels to this and it's, it's layered and it's a complex thing that you can't just say because CL made it, this person should make it. So what do we need to understand in that? Like, especially as I look at my students, right? Some of my yeah. students grew up in a similar way that you did. And then some of my students are growing up in the most atrocious situations I could ever imagine, yeah. right? And so how do I like, what is the mindset that I need to come with in that? I would say one of the first things we should acknowledge, like you were saying about, um, there are variables that we need to acknowledge. That like family structure, family history, um, uh, economics in the family, the financial, uh, piece, you have the, um, maybe uh, whether they were first generation, second generation, whether they were, all these things matter in, in, the, in the variable of anybody succeeding. Not just black men or black women, but anybody succeeding. Those are those variables. And if you can look at those variables and, and find them out and understand them, then you, like, one of the things over at Kingdom Prep, because I, you know, I go over there and do chapel twice a week and hopefully get more involved next year, mm-hmm. but um, when there's a day off of school for some of the grade schools, the Kingdom Prep teenage boys miss class, some of them do, to watch their siblings because mom or dad have to work. That's a variable that may not be in every household. Right. And so to, to know that variable, instead of now punishing them for their absence, when they're doing something positive for the family, how can we make it so that it's a, and, and so once you know the variables, you can, you can treat them according to their variables, not, not according to the generic. Right. You know, and I think if you get that's, that, that goes down to relationships, getting to know the person as an individual and, and, and finding out what's going on in their life. And they'll, they'll give you as much as they want to give you, as CL said. We only know them as much as he ch- shows us. Mm-hmm. But um, when you get to know him, you might find out, well, even in his moment, there are variables of, of, of struggle there that he may be, that we as individuals may not even identify as a struggle because we got through it with so much positive, like, I don't know, are you the oldest or the youngest in your family? Oldest. Oldest? 
So I, I'm the youngest, so I, I had some very bills already knocked down by my brother and sister mm. that I didn't have to deal with. Yeah. And, but I, so, so to me, they weren't even obstacles. Um, and so those kind of things are, are part of the conversation about knowing the person. Right. You, can, you can focus on those. And I think when you get to know the person too, you can help them see the blessings or the talents and gifts that they have mm. that can kind of act as their privilege. Because the, there's a certain level of confidence that you need to have and there's a certain perspective and lens you need to mm -hmm. view the earth. Like I look at it completely different. I don't think my parents ever really talked about white privilege to me. Mm -hmm. It's something I kind of figured out and there were other things they talked about my strength so I could use those and utilize those to better myself and to maneuver in the right way. Because there are also, because right. there has to be some type of privilege that I have or some type of blessing that I have that I can actually use. And I think I just have a different perspective. Like if I walk into a store and someone's looking at me, you have a choice. I have a choice to think, man, they probably think I'm stealing or I can say, they must think I'm handsome. I'm pretty good looking. <laughs> or they, they like the shoes that I'm wearing. So it's, right. it's all about that perspective and lens on how you want to view it and teaching them to have that confidence in themselves and more so in God. So that asset mindset yep. is what you grew up with versus what a lot of kids, I think, grow up with the deficit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it was kind of coming back to the, uh, the, the generations piece of things. Um, I mean, this is part of the reason why the mile markers part exists. One of the, the greatest and neatest things has come out of the Wake and Alive pieces is just the intergenerational component of it. Mm -hmm. That when, when you're young, when I'm young, I kind of am like, I need mom and dad. I need dad when my car breaks. But otherwise, pretty much everything else you have to say, I don't really need to pay attention to because that's, you know, this is the, Oh, back then it was the 90s. This is the 90s now. So, um, and, uh, and then as you get older, you start realizing that, oh my goodness, um, I got here because of the infusion of wisdom that God had given me through mentors who are older than me. Um, you know, that's what you guys are doing in, in your high school environment, you know, mentoring young people. And that's kind of what we hoped that would happen here too, is that by bringing the generations together, that the best learning, co-learning, because, yeah, sometimes as parents, do we need to relax a little bit? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll go pray afterwards, yeah. just you and me. Um, but so what I wanted to kind of, kind of come back to, within the black community, you talked about the, the challenge between generations that exists. What is, what is a, um, we were talking off camera, and this is where I want to get us back to, yeah. is you had talked about the fact, the, 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 at least the perception from your perspective, that too often the black community is not united unless it's through tragedy or fear, like, like you had said, that that's, those are the, some of the things that unite. Um, help, me, help us understand you know, the black community and the challenges that you see Let's start strictly here in Milwaukee, okay? I want to start here because that's where I grew up and I know this area. Um, if you just took a snapshot of Milwaukee, you would think that, that black equals poverty, black equals struggle, because that's all you see on, on the news. That's all you get the images of. You know, it's the positives. And, and it's been so long that there's been a lack of industry in Milwaukee that there's more poverty across the city of all cultures, but it, it is more evident when you think of, of, of highly populated areas, mm -hmm. okay? Um, that being said, history tells us that there was a time when, the, when the, the black community in Milwaukee was thriving, where there was home ownership or there was store ownership, there was a gas station ownership of, by black men and, and women in Milwaukee, and there was a thriving middle-class black community that was here. You don't get that feel anymore when you drive to Milwaukee. When you ask me about Milwaukee from outside of Milwaukee, they say, yeah, it's, that, that's the poor area. And they're usually pointing right to where black folks live. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they use terms that, you know, they call it a ghetto, they call it the hood, to do whatever else, that, but it's pejorative, really. And so when you, when you look at that, historically, you could say there was positive. There, there, there was equality. And I think we need to share that with the younger generation so that they know it. Because otherwise you think you always came from something bad. Same thing within the, the, the greater history of African, African Americans that there was a time after slavery where 
there were the two family, two parent households, and there were people that had, had their farms and they were working and they were providing for their family. And there was a time when there was really quality education in the black community because even though they had less resources, they were still raising children to care about education and to, to want to go a, a, to college. Right. So it, it, it wasn't that far ago, long ago, but then, um, and I, this is where I didn't want to go too deep into the woods because I don't know, I don't know the, the, his, the facts of it yet, so I apologize for not learning more. And, and, and we're going to give them a chance to run with this because we decided, we were talking beforehand, <laughs> do, do we go here because we don't know everything about it. We don't know what part is we were getting snippets of. But this, this actually speaks into the, the need for all of us to go and learn this history. So. And this, this is where racism as, a, as an undercurrent rears its head because there were people in, in America who, who held positions and that were part of communities where they looked like they... They cared, but they would do things that would destroy black communities. The obvious one being the Ku Klux Klan. Right. You know, we talk about that in reading history books like it was forever ago. I mean, it wasn't that far ago that that was an active organization that wasn't in hiding. Now it's still active, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming. I don't know, I've never been a member. But it's, I think it's probably more hidden than we know. Mm-hmm. And, and that, that still is there trying to be subversive to the growth of anyone that's not white. Um, and so that, that's hurt the black community because as I, as, I, as I look at history, there was positive growth. There were, we, had, we had people speaking positively from, from different corners of, of the black community. They were killed. And so imagine growing up, um, and, and I'm, gonna, I'm gonna take the black community and look at it as, a, as an individual for a moment. Yeah that you had two parents, and I'm gonna take the two most outspoken ones, there were others, I know, Malcolm and Martin, yep. who are raising up this, fam- this, this family of, of black people. And then you shoot mom and dad. And now that, that, that family is, is without a rudder and without anyone steering it, and that's what it's felt like in my lifetime, that where is the black leadership? Where's mom and dad? And, and, and there are a bunch of disappointed, frustrated, hurt um, children who are just trying to get along best they can. And, and so, so when, you, when you do that, when you take away parents from any household, when you take away the voices, the leaders from communities, you, there's a vacuum. And, and we've been living in that vacuum for a while, and so it's, um, George Floyd, his, his death is tragic. But if something comes out of all of these recent, over the last 15 year deaths that are now being filmed and, and, and put out there so we could see it, if the positive is that we have the real conversation and we identify the real problem and come up with, with some possible solutions to get back to real leadership, then, then that's a positive thing for the black community in my mind. But um, we have to recognize that, I, w- I would like white America to recognize that there are some within their midst who are actively trying to destroy the black community and black success. And not, and not, and not have to apologize for self if that wasn't you. Mm-hmm. But, but recognize that that happened, and, and, and that's why sometimes you have the difference in variations of, of those variables that are in the way. So, but so, so and, and, and we didn't, I mean, the, uh, the Tulsa incident, we didn't hear about until, we didn't know, I mean, in, in, in Wisconsin at least, until about maybe 15 years ago. It wasn't taught in our books. You weren't, you weren't, this is what history, this is what, so education has a problem too within the system. Education, which is what I learned in, in my Christian school, which I, I, I'm going to give them the, the benefit of the doubt. Mm-hmm. I, I was taught about slavery, as far as from the African standpoint, African American standpoint, slavery. Then I, then we, we had a little bit of some of the other points, but then it was civil rights. That's it. Mm-hmm. There was nothing about Tulsa. There was nothing about the thriving black community. There was nothing about, you know, um, any of the success stories that weren't Martin, and we didn't even hit Malcolm because it was a Christian school, so <laughs> he got he got he had no print, right. you know, and and so we don't even we're not we're not sharing the story correctly, the history, which will inform our present and hopefully dictate our future. But so this, we got to get the education of of white American, black American. You know, I I had a, I heard a teacher say this one time when I was at a, at, a, at a high school. It wasn't Wisco, by the way, so take heart. Um, I was walking past the class, and she said that um, the Civil War was about economics. 
I doubled back, knock, knock. Let's have a conversation in front of the students. I, I just, I couldn't let that pass. Yeah. The economics was that they were slaves who were working for free. That's the economics. Right. You can't skip that just to get to economics so it looks like there's no problem there. Right. So that's the kind of education we need to do where we talk about the problem without embarrassment. And, and, and I'm not asking white people to, to, to apologize right at this moment. I'm just saying, just, just tell the story. Yeah, give the real facts. Real facts. Give what really happened. And I, I guess this is a question for you. Do you ever feel like if you really get to dig into history and you look back, all of a sudden you see that your great grandparent or your uncle is racist as can be? Mm -hmm. Like, I don't, is that a fear for you or do you, have you ever even thought about that? Have I thought about that? Probably no, uh, in, in part just because, you know, it actually goes back to all a bunch of pastors, but pastors from the 40s and 50s. Mm -hmm. And we know pastors from the 40s and 50s had racist challenges, you know? So, and I didn't know my grandfather, but if, if, I, if I was to, when, if I was 20, and I found out that I would be mortified and embarrassed, I would be ashamed, um, but I would also be just about as susceptible to defending it, you know, his stance because he's my family, to try to see his perspective, you know? I, and again, as a younger person, mm -hmm when we have that idealistic, well, what do you mean? I came from a place of real ugly brokenness. No, nah, there had to be a real reason for him to see, oh, look, it's that, 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 and that. You know, for me now, um, I would rather talk about the elephants in the room. You know, the, the only path to healing, I mean, James talks about that idea, confess your sins to one another so that you may be healed. If there's something in my past, then I wanna know it and if I've been a part of it, so that I can confess it, so that there's healing between us and healing in my own heart. So today, to learn of, of something there in my past, no. I think what's, what's hard is, you know, because these are new conversations, you know, in me and my family, you know, um, to have hard conversations and, uh, and not, and to realize that the people that I love aren't where I'm at yet. So I think that that's probably the, it's maybe one of the fears that we in the white community have is that they're really going to hurt. But to, to take a stand on this in white America, um, it is risky because we don't know if the black community is going to trust us or take our words and actions in the kindest possible way. And white America is certainly going to, again, probably come from that, well, if you're willing to, to say that, then I might have to look in the mirror and I might see something ugly. And if I don't have Jesus, all I got is shame. And dang it all if I will face my shame. Yeah. You know? But at least you get a conversation out of it, at the very least. At the very least, yep. Yeah, I was telling uh, the Kenyan prep staff yesterday, I really don't expect um, white Americans to fully get it. Um, because it's, it's not something that affects them Personally, it, it affects all of us to some degree personally. Um, but I, like I said, I've been having this conversation since, since I can remember. And now that it's, because it's new to most of white America, it, there's a lot of catching up to do. And, and so sometimes in conversations like that, there's a frustration in trying to catch people up. And so uh, our, my request to, to, to us is that we are patient with you as you figure it out. Please. As, you, as you go through it, because Please. You, you, are, you are 46 years behind me in this conversation, you know, and even though we're the same age, I've had that uptick in that now. Um, you're a fast learner, I, I hear. So but that's a good thing. But um, that, that's, that's where we get to work with each other. And, and, and in Christ, Christ, the first thing he says about love is love is patient. <laughs> love is patient. So, so I, I, because we will have a conversation, I can be patient with you as you come up, and I don't have to judge every, every misstep, misword, you know, and, 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 and be like, okay, we're going to grow in this together, and I'm going to help you get to that point. And we, we may never, as a society, get to that, but as individuals, and that's where it starts, one-on-one, -on -one, right? And then we can talk about institutions. I heard a great thing on the radio about two weeks ago. Um, I'm, a, I'm a sports nut, so I was on the sports radio, and, and this uh, former athlete was told by his wife, I don't try to change the world, just make the change on whatever platform you have. 
And I've been taking that to heart because whether it's in your home, that's a platform, in your school, it's a platform, in your community. For me, my platform is, part of my platform is my, is my church body. That's why when I got the invitation from, from you guys, I, I, I couldn't say no to it because it's the conversation that if, if I'm not willing to have it, then in our church body, it probably won't continue to be had. Yeah. So um, wherever you're at, that's the platform. So, so we think about what can, I've had, I've had at least five white people ask me, what can I do? <laughs> and it's a weird question to answer yeah. because I don't know them in the situation. I, I, I'm assuming that those who had asked me because we're friends, it's not about a racist thing. They're just saying, how can I help the problem get better? And my answer is going to be the same as the wife said to her husband. Be a change of the platform that you are. Wherever you're at, be that person that, that, that doesn't judge on the stereotype, but gets to know the individual and then treats them according to that. That is willing to say, honestly, this is what happened in the past, and that was really bad, and it was wrong, and it was sinful and criminal. And have those honest conversations going forward where your platform is. And, um, and if we do that, by family, we will change society in a positive way. By, by, by schools, we'll change, you know, wherever our platform is. Because yeah. that's my fear about this moment. I think uh, Michael's generation wants, wants like all the change to happen in the world right now. And there are about five, six things that if you list them, you'd like to see institutions and stuff do better. Just, hey, start where you're at. If you're, you know, as, that's what, that's what uh, John the Baptist told the people at the, at, the, at the Bank of the Jordan, right? If you're a tax collector, don't collect more than you ought. Mm -hmm. If you're a, um, a soldier, don't, don't arrest people you shouldn't arrest. You know, he gave them individual things. That's your platform. So. And to piggyback off of something he said, too, um, for white people, like, asking that question, what can I do to help? Sometimes they have to realize that every black person doesn't want to be their history teacher. So at times, they have to do their oh, own yeah, homework, yeah. and they also have to find right. a black person like myself, or P. Rob, or Michael, who is willing to talk about it. Because some people don't want to talk about it because they're in a different space. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Their pain is completely different, and they don't necessarily have the relationship with a white person to have that conversation where they feel like they can be authentic, and they can be real, and it's no holds barred. So I think sometimes white people might want to approach any random black person, I wouldn't suggest doing that. No. I would more so suggest do your homework first <laughs> and then make sure that you find someone that is comfortable or has opened the door. Like I have an open door, like, hey, if you have something, don't, feel free to ask me, but don't just go to any random person because that becomes very annoying and irritating to a lot of black people to be like that history teacher. Yeah. Uh, just as we wind down this particular section, that idea of platform, huge. I mean, and this is, this, this is just the idea, again, you, you know, when we pray the Lord's Prayer, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, and that, that thy kingdom, your kingdom come, what is it that's your kingdom? Lord, for those who believe in you, keep them in the faith, and for those who do not know you, bring your gospel to them. And when you pray the Lord's Prayer, that's basically the whole gist of it. It's, it you know, thy will be done, the one to add on to that is crush the enemy. You're not my enemy. You're not my enemy. We're not enemies. There is an enemy. His name is Satan. We have a part of our human nature that is in full agreement with our enemy and says, yeah, let's do it that way. We have a world and a culture that is broken, and we're asking God to crush that. But that whole idea of forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us, starting with that whole humility. And I, and I love that you hit on platform because there's some of you who are listening right now or watching right now who are saying, I don't have a platform. I don't speak well. I don't have those outgoing personal things. I'm afraid. So what platform could I possibly have? The moment that you open your eyes and you become conscious, God has given you a platform to talk mm -hmm. with him. Don't know what the Lord's Prayer is, what those different itty-bitty little prayers really mean in it? You know, then go learn that. There's resources out there. What is, it with the, what is it that we're asking? Jesus taught us to pray these things. What, what does that mean? But then when your feet hit the floor, you've been given another platform. And as you walk in, you get into your car and you drive out, you've been given another platform. Whatever you have been given, the Bible will say, do it all for the glory of God. Do it all for the kingdom. Do it all that people would know that Jesus Christ is the one who brings life to the full. And in all this crazy, crazy chaos that we struggle with, God's going to bring an end to it. 
And when he does, and when that trumpet sounds, and when he reveals himself in full, how beautiful it will be to look around at the millions, now and for all time, who have come to life in Christ. And maybe, I don't know if it'll be like that before we get to heaven and the door is closed in this, but will we have a twinge of frustration and sadness in our heart when we realize how many times that we let our platform dictate a different narrative? I know that is for me. And that's where grace comes in. That God will forgive. He has already paid for every single one. And so... Pray about the platform that God has given you to be Jesus to somebody that we don't waste this moment that God has scratched open for America. But maybe not America, maybe it's just you and me. So when we talk about this topic, what's your prayer? What are you praying for? I've been praying a lot recently that my heart would break as hard as God's heart breaks for this cause. Uh, I don't understand. uh, And so I really want a heart that's going to break like Nehemiah is broke in the Bible Mm -hmm. for rebuilding the wall of Jerusalem and break in a way that is the same as my students is breaking. And then teach me how to respond in a way that is going to glorify him, not responding out of the need to look a certain way on Instagram or Facebook. <laughs> like, I, it's a whole other issue, but like, respond in a way that like God truly would, would call me to respond and then to be patient in that and wait and not feel like I have to do right away, but rather wait for his call and his discernment on how to respond. I just want a heart that breaks. <laughs> mm, nice. <laughs> I agree completely. Um, my prayer the past few weeks has been simply that, that my heart would break and that in that compassion for those who are hurting, specifically the black community, that, would, that I would move and that God would strengthen me and guide me to do something rather than just sit at home and pray about it and cry about it. Because <laughs> I feel like right now, especially, well, of course, with the pandemic going on, everyone has been home, right? right. Um, and we talked a little bit about this, about how the Christian community, at least what I have seen so far, is that a lot of people have been saying that Christians shouldn't be advocating and that Christians shouldn't be out there doing something. Um, and that somehow, in for Christians who are doing something and speaking out, that somehow we are not trusting in God to work in all of this. And so my prayer, to answer your question, has been, has been simply that my, that my heart will break and that he will move through me and use me to to something, if anything, even if it's just something as small as, which actually isn't small, as having a difficult conversation with friends, with family. Um, and like you said, doing what I can um, with my platform. So. Yeah, I think I've just been praying for people's hearts to change, mm-hmm. self-examination for myself, um, looking at praying that people focus on the right thing and just making sure that my heart is in the right place and then be willing to listen and call out our own selfishness. Mm -hmm. Because all this stems from us wanting too much power and greedy. I mean, that's what it all comes down to. Yeah, I agree with Mr. Whiteside. Um, I've just been praying that, uh, especially through the protests and riots that, you know, um, people are being protected and, you know, we keep a positive mentality. A lot of people go in there angry, you know, and let's, let's, let's do it in a calmly way. Uh, my, my prayer has been, um, I guess, so much selfish, so forgive me for saying that, but it's, no. it's asking God to, to, to help me figure out where I need to be in this space. Um, because if I, if, I, if, I, if I take up the mantle that, that I see before me, it could change the trajectory of my life and maybe my ministry. Um, and, and I don't know when, which way that would go. Right. Um, so that's been my prayer, Lord. Help me stand where you want me to stand in this moment and be who you need me to be in, uh, in this time so, um, so, so I can be your vessel. 
Um, so that's that's been my prayer. It's been more. It's been I've been figuring out where. My 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 heart goes out to to George Floyd's family. Uh, I, I I pray for them. I was um, I pray that they have time to grieve and time to mourn. Yeah. I, I don't I don't I don't think they need the spotlight as they do that. And that's having lost family members. That that is the time we kind of want to be to self. And they they don't have that right now. And I just pray that they would get that time. Um, and I, and I pray for our nation that that that. I think, as Mr. Whiteside said, I hear you. <laughs> the, um, that we don't get distracted by the wrong thing, you know, and and we don't, we, we don't lose focus on the fact that that is at the center of this there's hurt people, because other people hurt them, and for no other reason than whatever was going on in his mind, his hate, his racism, whatever it was, and and to get distracted or to go down different paths may not allow us to have the, the effect of the change that this moment could have if we were to, to, to focus in on it. And so um, those, those have been my, my prayers. I think I'll just, I'll just close by sharing mine um, that uh, I'm kind of praying, you know, right now for the church. Um, that the church would go back and remember what the gospel is and that that we in the church, particularly in our, our small little church body, you know, that we would not be silent now. That we would, um, we would speak as boldly, you know, the pandemic hit and, and people had something to say about that. You know, we look to our pastoral leaders to be able to help us understand what's happening in God's word in this. How do we make sense of it? Romans 8 and all these other things. And you start looking at some of the good things a pandemic brought. You know, my kids, both of them couldn't work for two months. So we got to play Euchre <laughs> at 1030 at night. You know, we're playing cards as a family, something that just wasn't happening before. And I was afraid we were going to not just that moment was going to fly on by. They're going to be out of the house and I would have missed it. You know, God gave us an opportunity to be able to have something great come out of something so, so devastating for this country. But that we in the church would not miss this in that when we as church leaders uh, don't have anything to say, I want to know why. I think we all need to be able to look in the mirror and, and ask that question why. It's, it's to your point you know, about it, to not take a stand on a social matter. I don't know, didn't Jesus walk through Samaria to talk to a woman about a little matter? It meant all the difference in the world, not only to her, but to her entire village that came out to hear what Jesus had to say. And so that we as a church would just draw in close to the gospel and um, being touched, like you said. I, I, just, I just do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment. Don't be drunk on yourself or your privilege. Don't be drunk on your poverty. Don't be drunk on your history. Don't be drunk on your whatever that puffs you up, that puffs me up to not see you as a human being equally loved and a co-heir with Christ. Now, and I'm going to put you on the spot again and see if you wouldn't mind just praying us out over this time together. God of all creation, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you created all of us. You gifted all of us differently uh, and you have placed us in this world at this time. Lord, uh, Help us as we gather around your word every day, as we have today. Uh, help us to hear your message of love for us and be comforted and strengthened by it. And then let, let us have the, the wisdom and then the, uh, the strength as you give us opportunity to share that message of love with the world. Lord, heal the wounds of racial division in, in our nation. I know it's a large task. It's been centuries old uh, of a problem that we've been having, but you're, you're God. You can do it. I know you can. Uh, you can. You can heal. Uh, you healed the, the ten lepers. You, you healed the, the, the lame and the sick as you walked this earth. You can heal this division, Lord, and so we pray that you would do that. And it starts, Lord, I believe one at a time, that you would come to us individually into our hearts as you have today, and you would give us comfort and peace. And help us, Lord, to, to not 
speak out of turn, but speak the words that you give us to speak through your spirit and his power. It's, it's in Christ's name that we pray and we do all things. Amen. 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 On a journey, mile markers show your progress toward a destination. New places to see. New people to meet. And yet, adulting? It's exciting. And it's hard. New experiences. New fears to conquer. New questions that need answers. None of us get to the destination on our own. When that destination feels a thousand miles away, you're not on that road alone. 